Hello everybody and welcome to this Care to Be talk in association with Screen Brussels. I'm Chris Evans, the locations editor for Care TV. Uh, while we wait for the attendees to join us uh, and for our uh, panelist Maya too, we're just going to play a very short video from our sponsors. Uh, then I'll introduce our panel and explain what the talk is all about. Hi, my name is Melvis, Kate Melvis. I am a writer and film director, but you probably already know me from my very successful and prize-winning film, Once Upon a Time in Etterbeek. You've obviously seen it, right? Anyway, let me tell you what I'm doing here in Brussels, Belgium, capital city of Europe. But also Brussels is the capital city of filmmaking. Here, I have everything I need to shoot amazing films. Awesome cast and crew, numerous locations, great post-production. I know what you're thinking. How can I get access to all of that? Well, easy peasy. Just remember two words. Friend, Brussels. So thanks to Screen Brussels there. Uh, so today we will be expanding on some of the key issues covered in our COVID-19 production report, discussing the role and responsibilities of COVID supervisors and their teams on sets, and how the film and TV production landscape has been transformed by the virus. Uh, before we start, a few bits of housekeeping. I will moderate a 30-minute discussion with our panelists before we open it up to questions from you, our live audience. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button in Zoom my colleague Nia Daniels is helping to moderate today's panel and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, right, let me introduce you to our panelists. Uh, we have Georgette Turner, who has worked as a UPM and supervising location manager for 15 years on big projects, including Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, and is now working on a 10th show, Apple's Ray James as a COVID UPM. Uh, we also have Noel Magis, managing director of the Screen Brussels Fund. Uh, Screen Brussels, our sponsors, have done a great deal to support the production industry, including initiating training for COVID supervisors. Uh, we're gonna have Maya uh, Vladaskic joining us, hopefully shortly, she's just dealing with an emergency on set. Uh, we also have Wes um, Hagen, a hugely experienced location manager, whose credits include The Accountant, Selma, and most recently, series four of Netflix's Emmy award-winning show, Ozark. Uh, and finally, we have Paul Greaves, managing director of First Option Safety Consultants, to provide guidance, training, and support for productions and COVID supervisors. Uh, a read of their invaluable yellow book is a must. Uh, let's start with the role and importance of COVID supervisors and UPMs on sets. So first let's discuss uh, what it actually takes to become a COVID supervisor or UPM and what they actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Georgette, do you want to kick us off on that front? I think it massively varies depending on what show you're on. I've been a COVID PM, a COVID UPM, a COVID supervisor, a COVID manager, a COVID safety manager. So depending on the studio, it depends on what they're dictating, but really my roles have become quite varied that you've got the, the basic level, which is obviously the stuff that we all assume, which is your wearing of the masks, washing hands, implementing facilitation. So like your sink units and your hand sanitizing units. And then you kind of go up in different levels depending on the size of the show and the production, just from working out how many toilets you need. If you've got 100 people on set, you have to work out how many times they're gonna need the toilet, how many people will be in those toilets, how many toilets you need to provide to enable social distancing, all the way up to budgeting an entire show and looking at how everything is affected by COVID. So if a show was 40 million before COVID, uh, it would have an existing budget and then you have to go through line by line and add on how things have been affected because of COVID and sort of highlight all those changes so that they can be tracked as an overage because of COVID, which can be from an additional makeup daily to additional cleaners to additional transport because you can't have as many people in a vehicle as before. Um, all working from home payments, it, it's all affected. So there's a lot of responsibilities involved. So what sort of training did you have? I know obviously Paul and Noel, you can touch on this in terms of the training, but Georgette, briefly, if you tell me what uh, training you actually received yourself before taking on the role. Um, I did the first option course that um, Paul Greaves very kindly put on. I was contacted to do the role by a, a very well-established line producer. Um, and I contacted Paul and asked if I could use my team because your teams are very essential to what you do because you have a trust element and it's, you know, it's a real trusted role. 
Uh, and first doctor very kindly put on a course just for me and my team to become supervisors. Um, I did the who there's free ones on the who website. So I did just, you know, generic who cleaning for COVID, um, was looking at stuff of how they implemented hospitals, seeing what we could tailor make that would work for us. Um, there was a course about, you know, virology and the, um, the, how the, the virus has traveled and how it's grown, uh, which was on a future learn, which is a website, another, another free course. Um, and then the screen seals course. And you just, you're really just picking up as much as you can because the data is constantly changing. So you, you need to be reading the NHS guidelines, always going back to the experts rather than kind of considering yourself an expert, but then seeing how you can adapt those expert views into a production way. And Paul, can you touch on some of the training you provide for productions and COVID supervisors as well? Yes, it's interesting this, and it, it, you know, I think it's worth saying at the beginning that it's, um, am I on? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's still a point of contention actually, what the training should be, uh, actually what the role is, and what responsibilities it should have, and what powers it should have. I mean, it's worth just reflecting on on how we've got to where we where we are the, at the beginning of lockdown when after everybody had shut everything down and people have quite quickly started turning their minds to how do we get back into production uh, groups like the British Film Commission's uh, working group and the broadcasters and indeed Bektu who were very fast out of the traps actually with uh, their own guidance I think recognized pretty early on that there was going to be a whole load of new stuff that needed to be done to enable production and that that couldn't really be done uh, by the by the standard production team mm. at least on a sizable production and um, and there weren't going to be enough health and safety people to draft in to do this so there needed to be a role um, our, our COVID supervisor training, which as I say, you know, we can have a debate about whether it's sufficient, or whether it's over the top or, or what, whatever, but essentially developed from uh, our first lot of guidance, which then people said, oh, it'd be good to have some training on this. So we, we, we put a, a, a Zoom course, which is entitled Snappily Managing COVID-19 on Productions. <laughs> uh, and then people said, oh, well, is this enough for COVID supervisor? We thought it probably wasn't enough because we felt that in addition to knowing the fundamentals of COVID, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the transmission routes, what, you know, what protocols needed to be put in place, people also needed to understand a little bit about health and safety law and the context uh, against which you know, all these things were being done. Really, we used to say, to, you know, to answer the question, why should I? You know, why, why do we need to do this sort of thing rather than, as opposed to just you know big for everybody's safety but what is the law that underpins it so we developed a course which uh, we thought should uh, align with the industry standard which is the x 3.5 occupational um, learning standard for safe management of productions so we essentially developed a two-part course which is the covid protocols and then a bit of the health and safety underpinning and manage safe management of productions and we felt that was a reasonable grounding for someone, and it's important to say, someone who had the necessary industry experience and the managerial and sort of, you know, personal skills to give effect to all that stuff. Um, so that's, that's how we developed our training. And I think it's worked reasonably well. We, we, we've uh, supported a lot of COVID supervisors like Georgette and her team and got very good feedback from productions about that. I think it's fair to say that there have been other productions where they brought people in, they might not have been at the right level, they might not have had the right amount of training and it hasn't worked as well, or there's been a mismatch in, in what um, the productions have expected from them, uh, whether, you know, uh, one way or another, whether they are expecting them to write the whole protocol and do the whole strategy and finding they, they're not really equipped to do that, or they're bringing in somebody quite high powered who they're expecting to just organize the hand sanitizer, which is a sort of mismatch. So I think there's still a bit of work to be done. I think it's getting better, but there's still a bit of work to be done on deciding you know, what the COVID supervisor is uh, and what the other, Georgette mentioned, you know, there are lots of tiers, COVID monitors, et cetera, and what yeah. is the appropriate and reasonable amount of training. 
Well, I was going to say, I imagine the role and the training must have to adapt, obviously, as the month progress and obviously as productions keep happening and ch new challenges are faced, you obviously then have to, as I say, adapt accordingly, don't you? No, absolutely. And, and also, you know, I think we need to move to a level of consensus in the industry about what the roles are and what the, and what the training therefore should be. And it's probably not a one size fits all because a big, a big production like uh, the one uh, Georgette's just been on is a very different beast to a small fact dent or, you know, something which is a much smaller, uh, you know, undertaking and you need a different level of person and you need a different team and uh, et cetera. So it's complex, but I think we're, we're getting there. And you must also have, I mean, in some cases you have someone like a consultant brought in specifically to deal with a production. And in other cases, you've got someone who's already a part of an existing production team who is sort of assigned as the COVID supervisor to oversee proceedings. Is that the case? I think that's absolutely right. And people say to us, do I need a COVID supervisor on my show? And we say, well, tell us about the show first, you know, because yeah. it's quite possible on a small show that somebody can be dual hatted. You know, you can train somebody up to, to, to know what to do. And if it's only a small team, that's easily done. You know, one of the things we are finding, and I hope productions are going in this direction, that inevitably at the beginning of this, we sort of threw the kitchen sink at COVID and COVID controls. And I think we now have a much better understanding about what's necessary, where the greatest risks are, what's less necessary. Um, and it's, we're starting to get, I think, to a much more sensible place on this. Uh, no, have you found it similar in, in sort of in Belgium in terms of the training you provide uh, for COVID supervisors? Yes, yeah, so the the way we uh, the way we work is um, is the following. We we were uh, very close to the professional associations since the very uh, beginning of the crisis of the pandemic. So we have organised surveys. We have uh, we were in close relationship with our colleagues also from the other region, uh, because you know in Belgium we have three, three regions, uh, two community, one federal state, and the challenge uh, was to have uh, one, one protocol and then to build a program and a, and a, and a training by, based on this protocol. So it appears quite soon that two tools were very, um, uh, very important to restart the shooting. First, to have a health and safety protocol dedicated to audiovisual activities and then having indeed someone who will be able to manage and enforce this protocol. And the main difficulties was to obtaining indeed a single protocol for the whole Belgium and especially in Brussels as we are at the, at the crossroad between the, the Flemish and the French speaking audiovisual ecosystem. So we need anyway in Brussels something which is relevant for the whole country and um, so we, we were in touch with our colleagues from Flanders and, and Wallonia and also with the professional association, the one for TV and, and cinema uh, production mainly. And then they, they, they were working on this, on, this, on this protocol and once the protocol was agreed and we started at the same time to uh, organize the way we could uh, uh, offer or propose a, a training and indeed how to balance uh, the training. Uh, is it uh, a very, uh, a very uh, a training that is made for, uh, let's say, a professional of the audiovisual professional, or is it for maybe people coming from the, the safety, uh, uh, safety and, and medicine world? And we, we balance that uh, with uh, experts. In, in fact, we were uh, really close to a company um, 360 solution and the job of this company is precisely to give uh, risk and safety management uh, advices and training and we put together in fact three main resources someone that is coming from the industry someone who has the uh, industry experience someone who was expert in, in safety in safety management and also expert in, in, um, in teaching experience because we had also to be very uh, relevant when we will organize this training. So uh, we, at the end, once the protocol was approved, the professional were, uh, have worked on, on the protocol to, to transfer the protocol in, 
in lessons, in, in, in courses. And uh, we went to uh, five uh, session webinars uh, of two hours. Uh, and then uh, it was also in French and in Flemish. And uh, we get uh, 200 people trained. They do not follow all the session, but at the end, we get 90 people that were um, that they followed all the, co the the courses and that can be graduate after the the, the seminar. Right, that's fascinating. So, in terms of the protocols, though, I'd like to sort of touch on those and, and how you sort of implement it on set. So, perhaps uh, Maya, welcome obviously to the conversation. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about Code 404 and some of the protocols that you put in place there on set? and the challenges you face, especially from transition from pre-production to production. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I, I think we, we kind of started from a good place. Uh, so our broadcaster, Sky, has prepared quite a lot of uh, protocols and, and guidelines that um, we, we kind of adapted to our production. Um, I had quite a lot of support from the in-house um, health and safety advisor. So again, it's, it's really helpful um, just to have someone, you know, um, next to you. And, and I think that the most important thing is obviously the, the protocols, but you need to get everyone on board. So um, I was actually just chatting to my producer that this is, this is the biggest support I've ever, I've ever uh, had from someone. And if the, the producer, the first, um, the location manager, kind of don't feel they, they are part of, of the solution to the COVID problem, um, then it's, it's never going to work. So, um, yeah, in terms of protocol, so obviously, you know, it's, uh, it's fairly simple. So we always try to socially distance. Obviously, said is not the place where you can do it easily. Um, so what we've been doing is we try to allocate spaces around the floor where we're actually filming to each department. So each department arriving on location knows where they go. So we separate ca two cameras, makeup, costume. Everyone has their allocated space. And the other big thing Thing we've had is um, a remote um, playback so we're using QTake and again we don't have a video village so everyone can watch um, what's happening on set from their, their zone so this is how we kind of try to um, minimize this the time that people will be spending together uh, we obviously have fairly robust uh, testing in place so that's something we rely um, fairly heavily on and obviously PPE so um, face mask visors um, has that been a challenge, um, having everyone wear masks on set? Uh, to be honest, people are really great. And I thought that we're going to have way more, you know, kind of um, difficult conversations. But I think everyone understands why we're doing this. And obviously, people hate it. You know, obviously, everyone, if, if they could, would take it away straight away. But, you know, each time I come on set, like people just adjust them just to make them, them, them look perfect. But yeah, I think actually it hasn't been as challenging as I anticipated. And is there a great appreciation of your role, Maya and Georgette, to, to you as well, um, in terms of your, you know, your, the importance on set and, and the power and responsibility you have and people taking it you know, seriously and realise, OK, these are important protocols that need to be put in place and we need to follow the guidance provided? I think Georgette, do you want to start? Sorry, yeah. I think it depends on the show. I mean, I've had, I've done 10 shows in COVID now in this role. Eight have been absolutely, you know, really really set on making sure you're supported and and there have been two that are not so much I think it depends on the individual and their um their personal reaction to COVID did they lock down sensibly did they social distance sensibly did they meet their families I think there's a real tapping on to what Paul said earlier about having an industry kind of um standard of what what the role should be and and what requirements should be met is really the next stage of this because every time you start a new show um you, you could you're only as good as your weakest member and so sometimes you're going in with all the support and sometimes um you, you can feel like you're just being paid for the privilege and it's not really a role that can tick a box everybody is in charge of covid and when enforcing protocols do you have to be careful not to be too prescriptive sometimes and, and put oh, people completely. off and people yeah off? i mean there's there are rules and then there are there's filming and sometimes everything doesn't go by the book but the whole point is that you have to stick to those rules as much as you can and then when there's a problem we problem solve because that's what we do but if that if you always start with being safe then nine times out of ten you're going you're to get around it um 
I also think that it gets a bit tricky when you're not set protocols. So I've been on some shows where I've been given protocols and that's a great place to start because that's what is expected of everybody. Um, there's your health and safety person for when you need to question the legislation or ask why, but everybody's working to the same hymn sheet. And I think there's a lot of onus now on some shows to write their own protocols, which I've also been involved in, but that can cause um, a lot of, questionability because it's almost like you then become the person that's setting the limits and so I think that that should really be taken off the COVID supervisor and just be mandated from the studio. Well that's an interesting point and actually Paul I was going to ask you um, how does a COVID supervisor or UPM differ to say a health and safety advisor? Well um, you know, in essence, not necessarily that much if they they know what they're doing and they're and they're uh, properly trained. Um, in the in on the on the issue of of COVID, I mean, the reason that we slightly walked away from supplying our own COVID supervisors is because they were being expected to drift into other areas. And you know, while they were doing the COVID, could they also check this rigging and uh, these, yeah. these elevated platforms and make sure the electricity is running well, you know? And that's, that's so obviously that, that, you know, the trained production health and safety person has got a much you know, broader set of skills and knowledge. Um, and, and, you know, we're, a lot of our, our consultants are doing both of course on on productions and they're they're de developing the protocols and helping implement them and working with the covid team probably and doing the normal health and safety stuff so there is a difference and i think it's it, you know it's it's um it's just important that uh we draw a pro sort of sensible line around what the responsibilities are um but I, I think going to the picking up Georgette's point about different behaviours, I mean, I think it is difficult because people inevitably respond differently to risks that aren't, that aren't immediately apparent. And I think everybody has a slightly different perception of what, uh, of, of what the COVID risk is out there. And you only, you know, you, any your circle of friends that they'll have different views i mean even you know my own family have different views between the kids my daughters are very good my sons you know doesn't believe in it um so you have to deal with that I, I, but i think the key thing around covid is of course as much as it's a sort of safety risk it's really a it's a it's a production interruption uh, you know business uh, continuity issue that that's the thing about it and uh, a lot of the things that have to be done are as, are as much about protecting the production as they are about protecting individuals on it. And, um, and that's necessary, you know, if people want to keep working. It struck me the other day listening to Adrian Wooten on the Today programme, uh, not what Adrian was saying, actually. Uh, he was talking about the, the industry getting back into business, but it was actually the Justin Webb, the interviewer, who was sort of incredulous and surprised that so much production activity was taking place and I think within the sector we forget that that actually we're a long way ahead of doing something quite ambitious compared to a lot of other sectors and a lot of other industries. Yeah no I completely agree I think there's an interesting point that you made about uh, protection I think that's a really key word because if you look for example at the insurance issue I mean what, what sort of cover is there for example for an appointed COVID supervisor consultant I mean are you covered by the production potentially I mean obviously you've got a lot of responsibility placed on one person uh, and the professional indemnity and public liability insurance is likely to be costly for the individual isn't it surely are you asking me <laughs> well georgette have you did you have in, have you had insurance I think cover personally, that again is an, because it's a hell of a new role that again is something that's evolving at the moment there are some people that say we should absolutely have our own insurance but if you had your ins own insurance then then you would negate the insurance of the production, meaning that it would be the onus on you. Whereas I'm employed by the production to do that role, so I am covered under their insurance. So right. okay. there's a whole load of questions with insurers going on currently as to where the role sits and, and what the insurance value should mean. Okay. Um, Where is, I want to bring I mean, just, you in just here. Just to add on that, I mean, it's- Oh, sorry, go on, Paul, yeah. No, just to finish on that, I mean, clearly, this is an area we understand uh, quite well. You can imagine our professional indemnity insurance for a team of 40 odd 
health and safety people is pretty uh, extensive, pretty expensive. Um, insurers are very nervy about COVID risks. And we say to all COVID supervisors, productions need to check that they are happy to cover that, you know, that, 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 that you're in, they are happy that their, their cover extends to your COVID supervisors. It's, um, uh, very much. that's nice, isn't it? Look at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, it, insurance is a difficult issue. Um, we, we recently, I mean, we just had an issue. Often productions like to have us add them as an additional insured to our policy. So they, they get covered under the health and safety policy that we have as a production. And uh, normally in, in normal times, that's never been an issue. Uh, our underwriters refused to do that for a big production only yesterday. So oh. th th it is an issue. And one that's gonna be resolved how exactly? Well, I'm not. I, I, I think that COVID supervisors are covered under their under their production policies, and right. I think a lot of productions have have covered them. What I just I'm just making the point that insurers are increasingly nervous about COVID risks. Of course risks. they are. Yeah. And never, um, you need to make the point is you need to make sure that you are covered and pay the extra premium, which no doubt they're going to charge you for it. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. Uh, Wes, I'm going to bring you in here in terms of how your role has changed and how you've had to adapt to the new environment as a location manager. What sort of key issues have you faced on set, particularly obviously working on Ozark? How has that changed? Well, right now we're, we're in prep on Ozark. We're, we're shooting for a November 9th start uh, shooting date. So we're kind of in a, a very heavy prep right now and we're, you know, adding people on a daily basis to our production. So, you know, it's, it's just we've, I've and I've also worked on a couple other productions before this one, um, you know, and uh, it uh, it's just slow and steady. It's a very fine line between the safety of everything and the production of it. Uh, you know, we're just we're just you know learning a lot as we go here. Uh, our health and safety team are provided by the studio, and I am you know directly working with them but uh they're kind of leading the charge they've set protocols for us um we uh we're just slow slow and steady right now we're really just you know trying to dot the i's and cross the t's with everything we've done but i think uh you know there's a lot of change that's come and uh we're, we're adapting with it as we go can you sort of paint a picture though in terms of how the set looks different, for example? What, what are some of the new protocols and, and, uh, and layouts of the, the set? Uh, well, I mean, as uh, Maja said, you know, the, the zones are a big thing. We're doing uh, color-coded zones like Group A, Group A1, Group B, C, and D. So we're, we're you know, delineating between people in the, in the production and what they do and what the... Um, what the exposure to you know the group a the the actors the director the camera operators the you know those those important people in our production um travel is is becoming a major issue with us because we're we're a very heavy location driven show ozark mm -hmm. so for example i mean our first block is 38 days 30 of those days are on location 40 different locations um so it's it's a lot we move during the day so right now we're being told that we can only have two potentially people in a production van at a time uh, by our covid team which you know for travel it adds an immense amount of time getting people to and from you know the set uh so you know we're also now being told that we we need to try and show locations that have crew parking adjacent so people can walk to the set so we can eliminate the van as much as possible. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated. I gotta say, location filming is complicated right now based on the protocols that we're given. Uh, are you just shooting in, the, you say lots of different locations, but are they just within the US or are you shooting in other countries too? Just in the US, but we do shoot in Chicago and we shoot in num a number of cities in the state of uh, Georgia. So 
And the COVID situation obviously varies from state to state, doesn't it? So I'm assuming the protocols and procedures must be different as well. Yeah, right now we're to potentially pushing our Chicago work because the state of Georgia has a ban of people, you know, you have to quarantine 14 days to go to Chicago, for example. So um, we're trying to figure out that part of it as, as well right now. It's complicated. I mean, I'm going to broaden this out to everyone else. And Maya, my, my, you must have similar difficulties constantly having to adapt to, to changes and new guidelines and protocols and, and situations on set. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, I think it is, it is a, a very dynamic situation and we have to kind of dynamically risk assess uh, because obviously, uh, you know, even with COW, which is a, a really short um, project, so seven weeks of shoot, when we started, the, the number of... Um, uh, the number of cases was very, very different. So the risk was uh, significantly lower. Now it goes up. We hear, you know, every week we hear about a production that either had a case or has shut down. So, you know, people are obviously getting way more scared. You know, everyone is more scared now. And then in terms of, you know, adapting to the, the guidelines, like one of the things is um, at the moment, the, the track and trace kicks in, in many uh, public spaces. So basically our message to our crew is like if you're going to go out and you know you get tapped into the system you might be pulled uh, off work for 14 days so what it effectively means for crew people are kind of really forced to this self-isolation and just going to work and doing nothing else because it's you know bars restaurants gyms um beauty parlors so it's it's really tricky um but in terms of like, yeah, moving from location to location, um, one thing we did in terms of like um, minimizing travel is um, the base is really, really a place for costume and makeup. So most, most of the times we try to find a space, a dining space for breakfast and lunch near location. So then crew doesn't have to travel back and forth. It's, it's somewhere nearby. Um, also, I think our, actually our location manager has been, you know, has done fantastic job in terms of setting everything. And, um, but I, I definitely think that location-based shows are more challenging than studios and there's way more um, to kind of cover around that. It's important to have extra time in pre-production, would you say, to make sure that you have all the protocols put in place correctly? Uh, whereas I, I can see you nodding there. Is that, is that the case yeah. for you guys? Time is everything. I mean, I feel like we're, we're up against it, but you know, Ozark is, uh, you know, in its fourth season. So it was a fairly well-oiled machine and cut, getting back into it is, 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 a, it's, it's, it's familiar, I guess. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're a team that's been together for a long time. We know each other. So that helps us a lot, but, uh, yeah, the location, uh, the location work is complicated. It, uh, you know, at finding finding everything close to uh, to base camp, crew parking, the location itself, all in one locations. Locations that serve for more than one purpose, as far as locations go. Even, you know, we're looking for places where we don't have to move, and we can go there and get three or four different locations in one, uh, for example. But um, yeah, it's uh, the testing, you know, testing two, three times a week, you know, for the A group becomes a time constraint too, you know, when you're testing throughout the day on location. Um, how do you break people? Do you do it at the top of the day? I'd be interested to hear what Maya's doing with that as well. Maya, do you want to come in there then? Testing, testing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we're testing twice a week uh, and we're not testing the whole crew. So as much as we try to schedule this, it kind of became a bit of an organic uh, thing. So what we try to do is, is to try to test most of the people uh, top of the day, kind of over breakfast. Uh, but obviously different departments have different, um, you know, work pattern. So uh, right. what I actually end up doing is um, I always have a nurse with some extra swaps. My COVID nurse was with us on set. They always do those additional tests for people we, we don't manage to capture during our kind of official testing hours. But yeah, I think testing actually is something that takes a lot of my time and my day uh, because obviously, obviously with every kind of schedule change, you have to go back to your plan and, and change it. And um, you have to kind of always plan a few, few days ahead, you know, who's coming back or any new kind of cast stance uh, essays. Um, People obviously don't live in London, uh, they're all around places. So we're also exchanging cast and crew, um, uh, crew uh, with other productions. So 
we're trying to kind of work together and uh, acknowledge each other tests. And what about making the transition from exteriors to you know internals or studio shots? So is that quite straightforward or do you have to completely transform and change your whole protocols once again? Uh, I'll tell you to Georgette, could you tackle that one? I think once you've got your framework there, it's um it, it's fine. People seem to have, you know, everybody watches the news, so they all, all have the mindset that being outside is safer because it's a more airy space. So the one thing that you have to do when you're in the stage is just keep people um, alert. They, they, they tend to relax on the stage. It's like going home and working at home. They just tend, they tend to let their guard down a bit more. So the, the enforcer of you kind of comes out a bit more when you're on the stage. Um, I'm sure Paul would probably know some sort of statistics where more accidents happen on the stage. I wonder if it's the same mentality, but it's just literally when people are out filming on location, they're much more alert and they're much more aware of what's going on. Whereas in the stage, they seem to relax. We always do that. Oh, when we get back in the stage, it'll be fine. Kind of feeling um, as professionals. So there's, there's a certain amount of that that takes on. And obviously when you're out in the open, you can, you can designate areas much easier than when you're on the stage. So you have to dictate more who can come on the stage, who can't, um, how many people at one time. Um, and even, you know, on some of the shows I've done, we've taken two stages when we've gone back to the stage so that we can separate an area for catering because what we haven't really touched on here is catering is a massive, massive um, part of COVID now with screens yeah, and kitchens and separate servers. And, um, and all the infrastructure that comes with that with deliveries and testing regimes for all of the catering staff as well as everybody else. It, it, it kind of makes the, makes the beast a lot bigger. When we first started hearing about COVID, we started to read things like there'd be less people on set and there'd be less runners. But in my experience, it's actually going up because you need, you need more people to be able to keep everybody safe. I was going to ask actually, whereas in terms of choosing locations in the first place, that must be uh, quite difficult in itself. It is. You have to look at alternative places. Uh, we we are looking. I mean, we have so many reoccurring locations that have been established throughout the years. You know, the Birdhouse, for example, is up on a lake north of the city where we shoot quite often. Um, so, I mean, to touch on Georgette's point, I mean, we we've also hired. An, an enormous amount of people that help our COVID team, you know, P, anywhere from a PA to maybe a production supervisor. And we're training them with our COVID team and what to do and how to help them. Um, basically, when we're on location and you've got 150 crew members working, how to kind of keep people in their lanes, you know. Uh, so it. Uh, it's working out right now, but uh, it's a lot of people we've added. We've probably got, I think, uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 right now on the COVID team staff uh, to help manage us. And we haven't even started shooting yet. So I would imagine we will grow. Um, That's really interesting. I was going to just finally bring in uh, Noel and Paul on a, uh, an important matter in terms of collaboration across countries. Because obviously you've got productions taking place all over the place, different guidelines, different protocols. Noel, have you worked with other sort of associations and, and bodies in other countries to sort of discuss what guidelines they're putting in place so you can have a sort of cross-border approach to make sure production have a sort of, let's say, collaborative setup? Um, at first, we did it uh, only in Belgium, but it's like uh, doing it in, a, in, in three different countries as we have three regions and sometimes things are a little bit different from one region to another, but we succeed to have one. And um, I know that some, of course, producers in Belgium are mainly co-producers. And I know, for instance, the case of a co-production with, with another country. Uh, and then it was a mix between the, the rules, of course, uh, in the country itself and, and, and the rules for the team coming from Belgium. One thing that I would stress also regarding the test is one thing that is important, I think, is that the, real, the reliability of the test because we had the case of a, of a shooting that has been to be stopped um, during a few days because someone was positive and then they retest, they retested, uh, let's say three days after and everyone was negative. So it's, it's indeed a, a, a big issue if to, to stop something with, with tests that are not reliable. 
Um, but indeed, it's, it's, it's more and more complicated and it adds cost uh, on, on the production. And I think it will, the situation is likely to last a long time, uh, a, few, a few months, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe more. But uh, I think the production have to deal it. And this is especially complicated when you have to co-produce with uh, other countries. And in Belgium, it's a small country. You are, we are mainly co-producers. So it, it brings more difficulty to the producers, of course. Yeah, okay. And listen, guys, I'm really uh, conscious of the time and the fact there are a lot of questions coming through. So I'm just going to turn to a few of them, if you don't mind. So first and foremost, there's one from uh, Luca Napper here at Smiling Fox, uh, asking, how have big productions adapted to filming stunt scenes and intimacy scenes since the UK safety guidelines were published? I think that's a really good question. Has there been a tendency to do testing and quarantining of the cast before sensitive scenes? Or is the industry moving more towards editing scripts to suit social distancing? Maya, do you want to come in there first? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, we, we obviously rely heavily on, on testing in terms of stunts. Um, and then we, we didn't really have any intimacy scenes. There was one thing. And what we ended up doing is we, we actually used um, essays, not our real cast. So we actually ended up using a real-time couple. And this is also how we kind of got away a few times um, in terms of like uh, scenes in restaurants uh, or in bars that people who are sat closely, they would just come from the same household. So there was a kind of safety precautions. Fantastic. Wes, can you, do you want to come in there? Uh, sorry, I, was, <laughs> I got sidetracked. I had an email come in that I had to respond to. What was the question? The, que the question was in terms of filming stunt scenes and intimacy scenes and how difficult it is under the, uh, the safety guidelines. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's testing. It's definitely testing and it's just limiting the amount of people that you're interacting with. Um, I haven't had to deal with uh, really any stunts yet, so um, we're, we're not shooting. So No. Okay. Georgia, do you want to quickly come in there before I get to the next question? Yeah, so we're actually doing a lot of stunts, heavily involving stunts. It's quite, there's a lot of fight scenes in uh, a show that I'm working on at the moment and there's a lot of, you know, biting and saliva and all this kind of stuff. So it's about working with the stunt coordinator and seeing what you could do instead and how close they have to be in. And also right from the beginning of the rehearsal period, our actors are tested three times a week, but we're just, whereas before you would be able to say, right, okay, they're in costume this day and they've got a read through this day and then you've got half an hour to practice stunts. Well, now everything has to be scheduled and planned properly. So if cast member A is fighting cast member B, let's choreograph all their fight scenes so that then B is out of the equation and A can fight D, just so that you're keeping those pods as slick as you can every time. So that if you do have an outbreak, you're isolating one unit as opposed to 12, 15 people all fighting at once or all being there ready to, to choreograph in the same space. So it's longer, longer hires on spaces and um, shortening. Sh it's always about shortening uh, your groups, making your groups smaller. Fantastic. Thank you for that, uh, Georgia. There's another good question here from uh, Milika Bozanic uh, from Film in Serbia, uh, asking how much financial pressure is COVID raising for projects given the additional costs to productions and how they're handling that? Is there an estimate of average budget inflation due to COVID? You know, longer hours, PPE, sanitization supplies, etc. cetera. Um, Noel, you're nodding your head there. Did you want to make a point? Um, we just um, saw that indeed um, the cost, the extra cost were between, uh, let's say, uh, 10 to sometimes 20 percent, depending on, on the configuration of the, of the shooting of the set. Uh, that's one of the reasons we have put more money to support the project we were investing in, uh, because it brings indeed more, more work for sure, more more, uh, more material, extra costs, some, some scripts uh, must be sometimes rewrite it. So indeed it, it will cost more to produce uh, in the pandemic uh, period. And again, I think it will last a long time. I, I also would just add that I think that at the moment it's, I don't know a percentage, I would give a percentage because it's different compared to the show, but at the moment, it's very top heavy cost, but that will start to come down as we settle into the role, as there are productions finishing that we can buy half their equipment back for half price, as we're moving into buildings that have already got social distancing in place, as we decide that actually you don't need um, a super 
supervising location manager and a COVID supervisor at this one place to take on those duties, we can miss some of it or sometimes the ADs can absorb some of the duties or the security or the marshals. I think as it starts to evolve, um, the labour and the, the facilitation will start to come down just because people have got something to compare it to as you do more shows. Fantastic. There's another good question here from Angela Jackson asking, have you seen new contractual clauses about stopping and restarting production or replacing someone so production can continue? Hmm. You want to come in here, uh, Paul? This is not really one for me. I'm afraid you need to ask one of the producers. Yeah, OK. Um, Maya, do you want to come in there? <laughs> No, I think, I think there is, I think there's a, what's, what's there to say is, is those things are usually driven by the studio or a production company or a broadcaster. And we as COVID supervisors, obviously, you know, we are aware of them, but we're, we're not really driving those. So um, that's not really part of this job. No, okay. Georgette, actually, there's a question, a good question for you here in terms of um, what should productions be using on set to decontaminate to make sure that everything is sanitized properly? aside from obviously gloves and masks and gel? Uh, well, you know, you can spend as much money as you want to spend on fancy projects, but uh, products and everybody claims to have the best product that kills COVID this way or that way. But ultimately, the government have put out wash your hands with soap and water because soap and water does, you know, does kill the virus. And there are lots of disinfectant sprays that you can buy standard household that you can use. The best advice I would say is we always read the labels. Because if you read the labels, there's a lot of antiviral sprays and alcohol sprays. There's a guidance for 60% alcohol. On the back, some sprays will say kills all germs, but it has to be left for five minutes. And there's also specialist sprays for catering areas because you can't use bleach and certain chemicals. So I would definitely say um, always read the labels, but, but generally the message is soap and water kills the virus. So use properly. You don't need to spend lots and lots of money. I mean, there's a more general point that I'd make here, which is, uh, and Georgette's absolutely right, and, and by the way, there's an awful lot of sort of snake oil out there with wonder products that kill all the rest of it. Actually, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is extremely easy to kill. Soap and water, as Georgette says, uh, normal disinfectants. So use the uh, EN1565, I think it is, I can't quite remember. Sean, our science guy, can, we, if you look at our thing, you can give, get all the the numbers but it it's, can be it's just cheap and, and and basic stuff and there was a lot of um there was a lot of talk at the beginning and i think a lot of it persists about the need for cleaning and deep cleaning and fogging and all this kind of stuff um and and i don't want to suggest for any moment that hygiene isn't important particularly hand washing and cleaning down of equipment but there's a there's a limit to that i think the the, the strong evidence now is that the contact risk, the so-called fomite risk of, of transmitting COVID is much, much, much lower than the airborne droplet uh, risk. Uh, we, I was on a call very recently with an eminent uh, US uh, immunologist, virologist who, who studies these things, who said that he thought the evidence for contact risk was something between two and 5% of all cases. So 95 to 98% of cases are, are through coughing and, and, you know, the airborne risk. His point was not that to, to not practice good hygiene, but his point was if you're spending 50% of your budget on hygiene stuff, you're probably spending it in the wrong place. Um, so that's just worth, I think that's worth saying. That's one of the areas where quite a lot of stuff came in early on. A lot of awful lot of things are being done and the whole business of quarantining equipment we don't advise that we don't think it's necessary um the survival of the virus on things like clothing paper very very low risk areas uh you know a good wipe down with a standard cleaning product and you're fine interesting really good point um wesley there's a question here uh, specifically for you from deborah waxchill saying are you using the PCR rapid tests? If so, what is your turnaround time for results? We are not, we are not. We are using uh, right now the uh, nasal swab PCR test and it goes off to a lab and it's, it's a 24 hour right now turnaround. But that, in my experience, I've, I've done a sputum test on a show, which is spitting in a cup. Um, and we've done shallow nasal swabs. I've had throat swabs, all PCR tests, but um, 
I, I did an HBO series back in Los Angeles where we, they were doing rapid tests and you took the test when you arrived and you uh, went in a tent and you waited and it was 15 to 30 minutes before you went to work uh, with a positive or a negative. Either way, you, you know, positive, you were quarantined and sent home, but, uh, you know, negative, go to work. So um, one show did that, but the, the show we're currently doing is uh, doing the PCR test, uh, nasal pharyngeal, and it is a roughly 24 hour right now. But that varies, I think, too, with the cases in the state that you're working in or country you're working in and whether or not, you know, the, the cases are going up or down. Right. Uh, but that's so, can I, can that I make mean, a general point about testing? Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mind? So the whole business of testing is, is, is central, actually, to production. It's becoming more and more central. And certainly, if you're working on a, a, any show that's got a U.S. co-production or, or is a U.S. production, their unions are very keen on testing, the SAG and DGA and all the rest of it. And of course, in the UK and, and indeed in Europe, you know, people recognize that testing is the only way that you can really safely get around the close contacts um, without PPE and that kind of stuff. An awful lot of misinformation and misunderstanding about testing the types of tests, etc. cetera. Um, essentially, the only, in our view, the only uh, currently available reliable tests for screening, and by the way, they're not foolproof, are the DNA, RNA detective tests, either PCR or the, the, some of the lamp tests that look for the virus in the, look for the DNA of the virus. And the reason that those are the only ones that are reliable for screening, because remember what you're not doing is what medics do, which is you know seeing a patient who's streaming and wanting to test and see whether it's COVID or something else. It's about, this is about screening asymptomatic, presymptomatic people who you, who are who you hope don't have it so it's a dip it's a different it's a different question you're asking and the 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 issue is that uh, you need to be able to detect viruses at extremely low levels in the first few days of infection and uh, only the sort of pcr and the and the isothermal tests will do that antibody tests which are an antigen tests which is what a lot of the rapid tests are. The yeah, I was just going to ask rapid. you about that. Actually, that's one of the questions that's come through, yeah, funnily so, enough. So, yeah, so, go ahead. And, so the, the test that's used widely in America is the Abbott antigen test. And that is a, you know, those tests are good as a sort of rough sieve, if you like, a coarse sieve to spot people who might be very infectious. Because, they, um, because their accuracy isn't so good, they throw up quite a lot of false, false positives. So you've got to pack them up with PCR tests. And productions, and I guess Ozark might have taken this view, sometimes find that actually using the rapid test causes more problems than they solve. Those tests aren't licensed as yet for use in the UK, and I don't think in the rest of Europe because they don't have a CE mark, so it's not even an option here. So the tests that we have in the UK and Europe are generally PCR back to the lab tests or some PCR or LAMP on-site tests. Uh, but not that many, to be honest. And the, and currently, as Georgette will tell you, because she's been wrestling a lot with this issue in the last few weeks, that the, the labs, because of the up, uptick in testing in the UK, have been struggling to get results back in 48 hours, although actually that's improved a bit in the last week or so. So testing is not an easy, is not an easy subject. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Sadly, there are a lot of suppliers who aren't really providing the right information and are pushing tests that aren't really suitable for the purposes that production want them. So I would just say to anybody, take advice, get an expert to tell you about testing. There are lots of nuances in it. You know, even the PCR tests really require a doctor to interrogate the results if you don't want to close down your production unnecessarily. For instance, uh, you know, the PCR tests, which are extremely accurate, will detect the virus or will detect the DNA of the virus long after you've had the infection. So what a lot of people are doing is they're isolating people who've had a positive test or they've got symptoms. And then to get them back into production, they're trying to test them again and finding they're still positive. Well, they are still positive because that test is detecting the DNA of the, of the virus. They're not infectious anymore. The PHE actually has guidance around this, which is if you get a test which is very close to the limit of detectability, i.e. very low levels of virus, 
you can test again. And if the next test is also positive, but only just very low, you don't have to treat it as a positive test. So there's a lot of nuance and science and difficult medical stuff around this, which a lot of testing providers, unfortunately, are not really providing in some cases. So we're dealing with quite a lot of uh, productions who are suddenly having problems. And it's like, well, what is your doctor saying? They say, we don't have a doctor. Well, what is the lab saying? We, say, we don't know. We can't talk to the lab. They don't know the questions to ask, etc. So although it is a, it's a critical part of getting production going, it's quite complex testing. It's, it's certainly changing sounds, yeah. and moving. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it's really interesting though, but I mean, obviously it can have a huge impact on the production because if you're getting your results in 30 minutes as opposed to, say, 48 hours, that's oh. quite, a, quite a difference. But, George, yes, well, you want also, to come in there quickly. Also, you know, if you're getting, if you're getting your results in, in we because we say with the PCR test, because it's not that good at detecting very early infection, we recommend that if you're going to do close contact work, you're going to put people in a bubble, you really need to do two tests over about four or five days to get a level of confidence that people are not infected and they have to sort of isolate themselves during that period as well. Then they can start working. Of course, if your tests are taking 48 hours to come back, that takes you seven days. So you're now asking people to lock down for seven days. You've got a seven day lead in. If you've got an on-site test where the tests come very quickly, you can test people. And even if the test misses, the fact that they've got the virus because you're only going to use them for a day or you know they're day players or sporting artists or whatever you know you're probably fine so the on-site testing and rapid results is absolutely the key but a lot of the rapid tests that are currently in use are not really up to the job okay uh, well let's let's move on briefly from um tests uh, actually no this question is related slightly but <laughs> it's a question for maya uh, or Wes. If someone tests positive on set, do you swap the whole department? What are the protocols regarding this? Maya, do you want to come in there? Uh, so uh, basically, uh, because the virus uh, can, um, if, if we had an infection, the, even if we tested someone immediately, it might not be, um, the, the infection might not be detected. So our protocol doesn't say you have to test everyone who's been in a close contact. It says everyone has to be isolated. So it is a slightly nuclear um, decision, but it actually proves us working um, because people, we, you know, you can, you can have an instance where um, someone uh, had a close contact to a person who was positive, they tested negative, then a few days later they were negative again, and then in almost two weeks time they can have a positive uh, result. So this is why our protocol says uh, you have to isolate those people rather than test them straight away. I think it's important to add though, and there's a bit of confusion around this, there's, there's a difference between the close co contact cohort, which is everybody you're putting in a bubble in order to be able to work closely together if they need to, and the people who've actually been in close contact with anybody who's developed symptoms or tested positive. And it's important that even people who are in the close contact cohort or the bubble still practice their social distancing and everything else whenever they can because the procedure that should happen is if you get a positive test or you get someone who develops symptoms you do your own contact tracing you apply the definitions that are on the government website about you know what close contact means and you just have to isolate the people who've actually been in close contact not the whole cohort right. um, so it's, you know, that's why it's so important, the organization of productions and the control of groups as a business protection measure is so important um, because you are unfortunately obliged to isolate people. And as Maya said, uh, you can test them, but uh, a negative test doesn't mean they're negative necessarily. And by the way, a negative test doesn't allow you under government guidance to release people from their isolation. Right, okay. Uh, there's another sort of question extending from that, Georgette. I mean, it's, someone's asking here, Angela Jackson's asking, how often are you doing temperature tests and are the results visible to both tester and people tested? Every day. The, the way that it works is quite simple. It's a small little laser gun, which is not a laser. Everyone thinks it's a real laser and you're perfectly safe. It's a still, small gun that, that checks your temperature. It's at the end, we do it at the entrance of every one of our buildings. So that if you did have a temperature, we would ask you if you're at a certain temperature to just sit down for 15 minutes and try and cool down in case you've been cycling to work etc 
um, then come back and do another test. Uh, we'd zap you again, and then if you're still presenting as temperature, we'd ask you to go home. The reason we do that outside is so that you never come into the building. So that if you are presenting, um, you come in. Now we haven't had, on all of the shows, I haven't had one person spike a temperature. And I think that's because there's such an onus on people to self declare every day or ring in and say that you feel sick. There's such a procedure that actually we've had some people say, I'm not, I'm not feeling well, I'm not coming in. So it's, it, we are doing it as a safety precaution, but actually what's working really well in my experience is that people are taking responsibility for how they feel and, and calling to have chats about certain situations. Great. Final couple of questions here. What, what's the actual guidance on social distancing on set as the experts are continually revising their understanding of how long and how far the virus can linger or transmit in the air? Paul, do you want to start on? Well, yeah, so the standard, the standard advice is what it's always been and it's two metres, you know, try and keep two metres apart. And um, obviously the government uh, sort of slightly gave that a bit of, a bit of uh, spin with the one metre plus rule, which basically means you can come within one metre of each other if you put some other mitigations in place, like face masks and that kind of thing. It's, it's absolutely right, though, to bear in mind that uh, there have been lots of instances of infection where people have been in the same space and been well beyond two metres and have caught the virus and the thing that we stress is size of space number of people ventilation absolutely critical to have good ventilation and time you know spent in the place we we stress that it's really important to avoid crowded spaces enclosed spaces airless spaces as much as possible so we're often talking to productions as particularly on sound stages and studios about how they can get the get the elephant doors open in between takes and all that kind of stuff, you know, get the fans going, make sure there aren't too many people in there at once for too long, all talking, singing, shouting, etc. because there definitely is strong evidence of, it's not really an airborne spread, but it's aerosol uh, buildup going further than the two meters. Two meters is an arbitrary number, right? The World Health Organization says one meter, Germans say 1.5, I don't know what it is in Belgium, probably 1.8 or something. But two meters is a, you know, you, you, you are protecting yourself from the vast majority of infections. That doesn't mean that the infection can't go beyond two meters, particularly if you allow it to build up in airless, you know, air that's not moving, etc. cetera. Brilliant. And final question here, um, are productions expected to underwrite long COVID symptoms into the long term? If someone gets sick and is invalid, long term basically is the question. I think sickness as a whole is something that we have to, moving into flu, uh, flu season, really um, pay a lot of attention. This yeah, goes to what Paul was saying about the business risk. So, you know, you may not have COVID, but if I've got 10 people with the flu and a temperature, um, that, that's also just as much of a risk to production because you then have to isolate. So what we ask is that if you've got, you know, if you're having any symptoms and you've had your test and even if you're negative and you've done the three tests, we, we, we expect three clear tests before you can come back to work if you've had some sort of symptoms. Um, you have to be completely symptom free. You can't out test the flu even. You have to be completely symptom free just because you could then come into work and pass the flu on to somebody else, which is just, you know, just as dangerous to our production as anything else. So as we move into flu se season, the washing your hands and the sanitizing is just as important as ever for, for all those reasons. And the masks will, will help that too. But in terms of long-term illnesses, um, and it wraps up your question earlier about, you know, what, what are we doing if someone gets ill, are we just sacking them and getting somebody else in, et cetera, et cetera. Currently, there is a whole movement of trying to um, give people the to incentivize them to say, hey, I'm not feeling well, I don't want to come to work. We're incentivizing people to work from home where possible. So if I say you're going to be off the job if you're not feeling well, that's not really great for my production as a whole. I have to incentivize you and make you feel secure and safe at work to come to me and tell me that you're not feeling well so we can try and enable you to do your job from home, which means that the safety of the crew is obviously protected. Perfect. I'm just going to ask quickly one final point, uh, one from each of you actually, a key challenge going into 2021 for productions. Georgette, do you want to start? We'll, we'll go through Georgette, Noel, Paul, Maya, then Wesley. Um, I think workforce is a big 
is a big thing. Um, at the moment, we everybody said, oh, it's really busy. And actually, I think if you look at the production shooting, it's not actually that busy, but everybody's using a lot more people. So I think moving forward, it's um, just just workforce. And, and, and also what I'm starting to notice with COVID supervisors, where phone is ringing off the hook, being offered jobs, because people want people that have done it before. Well, I hadn't done it three months ago. So I think that just just the mindset of and crew and how we get people back into the industry, having not got any furlough or any sorts of pay for four months, it's not really incentivizing the industry to get people into it. Okay, great. Uh, no? Um, I think that it's a little bit aside, but um, maybe that um, innovation, new technology can also bring some solution maybe in in the first in the first level but maybe some of the new uh, technology will will bring uh, new ways of um, supporting producing with them some some uh, some some, um, some new innovation i think that virtual production can be also something that could be interesting to avoid some 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 uh, contact some some something so maybe we have to also trust uh, uh, new technology and innovation to, to, to face the challenging of, of uh, production now. I agree. Paul? Uh, I think it's a, it, it, we've got a very challenging time coming ahead. I think, uh, you know, as we, as we said earlier, the sector uh, managed to get itself back into business in, you know, when you can think about it with very large groups of people working in sort of ad hoc spaces on a, a, a drop of a hat. Uh, in close proximity, a lot of them um, in a way that lots of sectors haven't. And against a backdrop of rising uh, infection rates, in, you know, when we read today that the infection rate is now one in 200, mm. as opposed to a few weeks ago when I was telling people, you know, take, keep it in perspective, it's now one in, it's only one in 3,000. Um, you know, the infection rate has gone up. Now, Admittedly, uh, you know, part of that is because we're doing a lot more testing and identifying a lot more cases. But nevertheless, the infection rates are much higher. And my fear is if, if productions become weary about uh, managing this and start to cut corners, we'll only need one big infection event. And I think there could be a big clampdown on the sector. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think already you can see the government thinking about is the pub curfew enough? Is the, you know, all that enough? What about cinemas? What about theatres? What about sporting events? A big infection event on a production, I think, would be very damaging to the progress we've made. So that's the challenge, I think, over the winter months. Could you agree? Uh, Maya? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I completely agree with everyone else. I think for me, um, the challenge is the, the kind of human, you know, human factor and how we all as crew, you know, um, work and it does have a massive impact on everyone's, you know, well-being and stress levels and also not being able to, you know, socialize um, on set. Like it is such an important part of this job and this is why we enjoy it because you make all these connections with people. Um, you meet just for a few weeks or a few months. Um, so I think this is, this is going to be really challenging to, to enjoy this work. Um, in those circumstances where you can't, you know, you're not allowed to speak to someone from outside your bubble. You know, I barely speak to any of my cast because I'm not part of the testing um, group. So I think this, this, this can take a lot of joy and, and you know, maybe even some of the, the, the value on the screen. Great. Okay. Where's finally? Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more with everybody. Um, I, just, I believe that flexibility in, in the future is going to be key, you know, with the creative side and, and, and understanding that you're not always going to get exactly what you wrote on the page. You know, you're, you're going to have to be flexible and uh, come up with new creative solutions to uh, make your project. Um, but, uh, yeah, technology will play in it too, I think. Uh, we're using Matterport. We didn't touch on that very much, but the virtual touring of uh, locations, you know, from computer screens. So, it's, yeah, uh, that's, that's certainly going to be the, the way forward, isn't it? It's being used more and more, isn't it? Yeah, I'm using it quite a bit, and it's working well for you so far. So far, it is. Yeah, we're sharing screens and walking through virtual tours of locations uh, from our desks. 
uh, it doesn't it doesn't eliminate the need to go there, of course, but it does limit the times you need to go there, which helps. Fantastic. All right, well, listen, that's been brilliant. Thank you so much to all of you. You've been fantastic speakers, uh, much appreciated, and to our sponsor, obviously, as well, uh, Screen Brussels. Um, so, yes, thanks to everyone for coming and uh, watching, too. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Godspeed, Wes. Can't wait for the next one. <laughs> Bye. 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 Hi, my name is Melvis, Kate Melvis. I am a writer and film director, but you probably already know me from my very successful and prize-winning film, Once Upon a Time in Atterbeek. You've obviously seen it, right? Anyway, let me tell you what I'm doing here in Brussels, Belgium, capital city of Europe. But also Brussels is the capital city of filmmaking. Here, I have everything I need to shoot amazing films. Awesome cast and crew, numerous location, great post-production. I know what you're thinking. How can I get access to all of that? Well, easy peasy. Just remember two words. Trend Brussels.